we felt like we shouldn't uh, leave this very exciting uh, lesson until we give you a summary of it. And we decided that a summary of the lesson would be better found in, 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 uh, in scriptures than it would in, you might say, in teaching. Uh, well, let's go a little further in opinions. And so we have decided in the summary of, of this entire group of lessons that we have had that what we will do is to give you one verse in each chapter. I want to tell you now that was hard to do. Some of these chapters was good. You'd like to have 12 verses at least in that one chapter. And, and so it was very difficult to find one verse that we felt like well, we didn't, want to, we didn't want you to feel like that it was better than the other, that it just was uh, more representative possibly. And so we trust that you will enjoy your final lesson for this time in this exciting book, Book of Romans. In chapter 1, we have chosen verse 16. It is a tremendous verse. Paul made an astounding statement. He said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. If the whole total church had never been ashamed of the gospel of Christ, the world would have been evangelized. Our generation would be evangelized if we were not ashamed. We get opportunities and we deliberately pass them by, you see. And, uh, and then we have so many of our people that they love the Lord, they serve the Lord, but they say they're timid. They're not timid at the dinner table. And they're not timid at the baseball game, if you heard that gang last night. Now, 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 you see, if we made as much noise as that bunch made, they'd call us fanatics. And they call themselves fans. Well, I know the attic goes on it. And so anyway, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why? You know, he didn't just leave you hanging out there saying he wasn't ashamed. He said, because... The gospel of Jesus Christ is, say is. is. It is the power of God. The gospel is, when you preach the gospel, that is the power of God unto salvation. It's the power of God that brings you redemption, that brings you your position in heaven, that causes your name to be inscribed in the Lamb's book of life. The preaching of the simplicity of the cross of Jesus Christ, which is the gospel. It has power to change people while you're talking it. While you're talking it. While you're saying it, it has power and authority to everyone. Say everyone. You know, the totality of the human race to everyone. What you got to do? You got to believe the thing. You got to believe the thing. Well, you got to believe in everything. You just name it and you got to believe in it. The only way to make it adaptable to you is, is your faith in it, your trust in it. Whether it's eating a dinner at a restaurant or whether it's riding on a plane, you've got to have faith that the thing's going to work out all right. Can you say amen? amen? To him to believe it. And he says to the religious person, the Jew, the religious person, and also to the Greek, the intellectual person. So whether you're a religious person or an intellectual person, it makes no difference. The gospel works. And all the people said... In chapter 2, we chose verse 11. It says, For there is no respect of persons with God. Each one of these has a problem with it. It's a sermon, and we don't have time for 12 sermons right now. I wouldn't want to ask you how many are glad for that either. Anyway, there are no respect of persons, whether you are tremendously intellectual or whether you are a person that's unlearned whether you're a very wealthy person or a person that has nothing, there is no respect of humans with the Almighty. He looks at you and you all got one nose. He looks at you and you all got two eyes. He says, well, you're one of them. No matter if your body is dirty or clean, you're one of them. You see? How do you love the gospel that way? Yeah, that includes all of us. In chapter 3, we chose verse 24. It says, being justified freely by his grace. You see how these become sermons, every one of them? You and I are just as if we had never sinned. That's what justification means. We are just as if we had never sinned. We're just like the angels in heaven. That we have been wiped away of every sin and cleansed from every sin. Being justified freely 
not by your accomplishments, not even by your faith, but by his grace. He does it by unmerited grace. You, you don't get it in any way but by his sovereign grace. By his grace, you get it through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So we are justified freely. That means completely and absolutely freely by his grace, the gift of God. No achievement on, of the human person, but the gift of God to him. In chapter 4, the verse that we have chosen is number 5. It says, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Now, this is a, uh, uh, an involved statement where we should uh, give, you know, amplitude to, but I'm sure that we did at the time we were studying that chapter. But when you return to it, you always want to give uh, amplification to it. It says, to him that worketh not. Now, you, that don't mean your daily bread. We're not talking about your daily bread. But it, it's that man that crawls on his knees, you know, down, down, down there trying to find favor with God, or a man that we have seen in some countries beat his back until he's bleeding all down his back, you see, to, to, to the person that doesn't go after that. And even the guy that, that thinks that, that, that uh, Saturday is the only day to worship God, that Saturday is the only day, that Sunday is not the day, that Saturday is the day. To the person that's opposite of this, who doesn't try to achieve these things in him, that worketh not, but he believeth. Say believeth. He, he, he doesn't do that, but he believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. I tell you, what a sermon. Don't that get you going inside? Are you here or not? Amen. Dear Lord, I thought you were excitable. I didn't know that you were uh, as you are. <clears throat> I'm glad I leave out words sometimes. There are adjectives that I leave out. Ah. And, and verse, and chapter 5, we chose verse 1. Therefore, being justified, no person ever preached salvation for the lost so capably as this man did. You say, why? He was a traveling salesman for Jesus, and he got well acquainted with his goods. He knew how to sell it on any street corner or any marketplace. And that is the reason he could say it so many different ways. So he's, he's still talking about justification. And you see, we've been doing it all the way down through there in different chapters. We're justified by our faith. Another word for faith is trust. But our trust in the efficacious death of the Lord Jesus Christ upon the cross. By, by our trust, we have peace with God. Say peace. The peace that we have in our hearts came from God, and it's because we are justified, not by merited activities or works, but by our faith in the blood of Jesus, our faith in Calvary, our faith in his resurrection, our faith in him as our glorious Savior. Because of that, we are justified. And how glad we are that we are, are justified. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God, through our Lord Jesus Christ. In chapter 6, we chose verse uh, uh, 23. For the wages of sin is death. He's still dealing with that justification. How are you going to be justified, you know? The wages of sin, and, and this is a text that's been moved in, around all over the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, we have to use this text, that sin does have wages. If you sin, you got wages for that. And many times we don't like our wages. When we get our paycheck, we don't like it. The Bible says that sin has wages, that you get your repayment from sin. Well, you, it's the same with good things. If you do good things, you get wages. You get paid back for it. If you love God, you get repayment for that. If you serve God, you get repayment for that. If you give to God, you get repayment for that. So when you serve sin, you get repayment, but you get repayment in the same kind of goods. You sow anger, and you get it boiling back at you. You sow hate, and you get it back. So many people don't like the condition they're in, and it's your pages, your, your wages you got back from the devil. He paid you back. 
Evil people are not happy people. Did you know that? Evil people are not happy people. Ungodly people are not happy people. The people in these great, in these great prison houses of the world are not happy people. In the prison house, they're getting their wages back getting their wages back, double over, and they don't, like, they don't like their wages. The wages of sin happens to be death. Death to joy, death to peace, death to life, death in every form that you can imagine, that it is death. But, put a little circle on that word, but, I love circles, you know. A little circle on that word, but. But the gift of God, the gift of God, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What is the gift of God? It is eternal life. It's immortality. And this gift that God gives us is, is of eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You wouldn't have gotten it otherwise. And in verse, in chapter 7, and we're using verse 6, but now we are delivered from the law. He makes this so plain in his book. We're not living in the book of Exodus. We're living in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, and First and Second Corinthians. I'm glad you're living on the right side of the book. That is the right side of the book, isn't it? And on the right side of the book, we're, 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 we're living in the new covenant. But you say, well, why do we have the old covenant? Because it gives us so many things that approves itself in the new covenant. That it is the beginning and the other is the end and it is a continuation of grace. It is a continuation of the teaching of the Almighty God and it's so good to have the old covenant. Can you say amen? We're not Jews that were in Egypt that had to get out of Egypt so we don't have to carry the Lord's day because that, that day that they came out of Egypt, they set themselves up as a Sabbath day. You see? That, that began to be their Sabbath, their day of deliverance out of Egypt. They says, now, every week, let us remember this day. Before that time, they did not have a Saturday as a Sabbath. It happened that that was the day that they got delivered from Egypt, and they instituted that as their day of worship, which is all right. You and I institute, institute another day, and that's the day, the day that Jesus rose from the dead. Yeah, the whole universe hinges on that day, and it's a bigger day than the other day. And when he rose from the dead, it wasn't just for Jews, it was for everybody. Amen. And so we are glad that our worship day, and we don't even worship days, we live as good on Mondays as we do on Tuesday, but on the day that we set aside, and, and in, in Romans 14, you know, he, 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 does, he revolve, revolves that whole thing. So if you keep a day, you keep it unto the Lord. If you don't keep a day, you don't keep it to the Lord. If you eat, you eat unto the Lord. If you don't eat, you don't eat unto the Lord. So he says it's your relationship with God that means everything and not what hour you pray. We should pray all the time. Pray without ceasing. And all the people said, all right, you're delivered from the law that being dead wherein we were held, we were in the law, the people of the Old Testament were in the law, and they were dead, they, didn't, they weren't spiritually alive, that we should serve in the newness of spirit. I'd put a little circle there if I were you, that one, around those three words, newness of spirit. We are a new thing in heaven. We are a new thing in the earth. We are those that have been renewed by the Holy Ghost of God, born again, changed, and how glad we are to be the sons and the daughters of the Most High God. And we don't belong to the oldness of the letter. That's speaking of the, of the, not the Ten Commandments, but of the ordinances that they set up for their worship times. In chapter 8, we have chosen verse 1. There is therefore now, hey, this is a good one, isn't it? There is therefore now, say now. Well, if I was you, I'd make a little, another little circle. These circles are real pretty, you know. There's therefore now, not tomorrow, not next week, not next year, not in eternity, not after you die. There's therefore now no condemnation to them which are in. Well, I like circles, you know. That are in Christ Jesus. That if you're in Christ Jesus, you are not condemned in any form whatsoever. Come on, say something. Don't just look at me. We, we, we have no condemnation. Whatever you may have done before that, whatever sins you may have committed before that, they don't, they don't count today. For the simple reason, there is therefore now no condemnation. Why? Because we are in Christ Jesus. But a lot of people don't like the rest of the verse. 
How are you in Christ Jesus? Because you don't walk after the flesh. You don't live the way sinners do. Are you here? If you're going to do everything sinners do, it seems to me that you're a sinner. If you're going to bray like a donkey, it seems to me like you're a donkey. If you bark like a dog, it seems to me like you're a dog. If you live like sinners, it seems to me like you're a sinner. Who walk not after the flesh, but we walk after the Spirit. In chapter 9, we have chosen verse 3. It says, For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. The Bible says that, that for a good man, one possibly might die. But it, it says not many people would die for someone. Here is a man so deeply in love with the world, with lost people, that he would forfeit his place in heaven. Can you imagine that? He would forfeit his place in heaven to get them saved. I've seen wives almost like that. They want their husbands saved so much. They want their husbands saved so strong until they would just do anything to get that husband saved. And I, I think that's a wonderful, wonderful attitude. And God understands that. God understands that. And no doubt, no doubt, millions of Jews have been saved from that moment he said that until this day. For the simple reason they saw the dedication of a man who was willing actually to lay down his life, more than that, lose his place in heaven to get other people there. That, that's a little further out than I'm able to go, reach out to. And I imagine it, it would be the same for you, but that's exactly what he said. To get his kinsmen saved, he would even be willing to be a curse from Christ. Now, God won't ever accept that. God saw that. And no doubt heaven bowed its head and says, what a man, what a man, willing to give up heaven in order to get other people here. But you don't have to give up heaven to get other people there. Jesus paid it all, and it's all paid, and you don't have to do anything about it, but tell them about it. Can you say amen? In verse 9, I mean, in chapter number 10, we have used uh, verse 17. So then, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. How could you find so many texts as you find in this book? Isn't that amazing? And, and mind you, we're not giving you all the texts. I mean, we just give you one little one out of each chapter here. And so that as we depart from the book of Romans, we have a summary of it, of the dynamics of such a writing as, as Paul gave. It had to come from the Holy Ghost. Certainly no man could conceive of the wisdom that's found in this book. How does faith come to us? Faith cometh by opening our inner part to hear, to hear, to, to hear. Uh, uh, you got to get it on the inside. You, have, you hear it, and it becomes part of your brain, becomes part of your thinking. So faith cometh by assimilating this truth of God to the insides of us, all the mind, emotions, and will, the total, the total insides. That faith uh, comes to us when we get the insides full of, of, of the Word. And he says, and hearing by the Word of God. So if you want faith in you, fill your insides with the Word of God, with the Word of God, with the Word of God. You can even buy the whole Bible and the New Testament on tape and can just turn it on in your apartment or in your home and just let it flow through the house all the time. Just the Word of God floating around in your house. And, Every time you hear something, it's the Word of God being spoken. I had some of these tapes, and I put them in my car, and I would, and, and I would, uh, I would play them. But I, I discovered something, that between my gate of my home and my door to my, to my office, it took just about, just about 12 seconds. I wasn't getting much. I, I just... <laughs> <laughs> need to drive further to get to church, that's all. Some of you get to hear a whole book before you get here. That's living too far away. And, and chapter 11, we chose verse 33. All oh, the depth, isn't this good? Ah, oh, all the depth of the riches, of the wisdom, the knowledge of Almighty. He had had a revelation. He'd had a, he'd had a view over that land of the omniscience of God, all-knowing, 
God. He says the depths of the riches, wisdom, the knowledge of the Almighty, unsearchable are his judgments. His ways are past finding out. That's what eternity is going to be about. That's what eternity. We're going to learn and learn and learn and learn and learn and learn. Billions of years of accepting and receiving and drinking in. Oh, oh, what a, what a future we have. Are you glad for that future? What a future we have. How wonderful it is to know that we have all these blessed things out there in, in, in front of us. So that was number 11. Number 12, we chose verse 2. And be not conformed. This is, this is one of my, this is one of my, 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 my good ones. You want to know why? You want me to tell on myself. When I went to school down south, they not only let the Bible be in the school, they made you put it in your heart. And we had memory verses in the Bible. And our class had the memory verses of this chapter 12. And you want to know the truth? I didn't learn it at all. And when I got to school, the teacher made me write this chapter 12 on the board about 10 times. I got home an hour late. My mother said, what in the world you've been doing? I said, writing the Bible. <laughs> she didn't believe it, you know. She knew I'd be writing something other, but not the Bible. Be not conformed to this world. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Isn't that great? Transform by the renewing of your mind, making your mind think differently, live differently, that ye may prove what is that good, acceptable, perfect. Isn't that, isn't that great? Th three, three attitudes toward the will of God. Three, acceptable will of God, perfect will of God. That is good, the good will of God. And so God wants us to, to, to walk in his, his glorious will. His will for us is always great. His will for us is always happiness. And all the people said, in chapter 13, we chose verse 8. Oh, no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Now, I think you ought to start living up to that. Stop buying stuff on credit. When do you have money before you buy stuff? It, it says, oh, no man anything. Now, we know for a house or maybe for a car, that, that type of thing might be very difficult for you. But the smaller things inside your house, do without them till you can afford them. Thank you. I only need one to encourage me. Just one does the job. In, in, in chapter 15, we took verse 1. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. That is one of the great scriptures. We, that lesson we had just very recently here. That if you're strong, you don't abhor the weak. You don't curse the weak. You don't push them down. If you're strong, then what you're supposed to do is to help the weak by bearing their, their weaknesses and bearing their sorrows and sorrows and hurts and, and helping them to get strong. Can you say amen? amen? And then in the last chapter, chapter 16, we chose verse 25. Now, to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. He just simply told you that all the wonderful things in this book of Romans had been kept secret from the world because they were living in another dispensation. Jesus first had to come and to give his life on Calvary. Then we began this new and last dispensation of grace. And so we have it today. How many glad we got it? We have it today and how glad we are that we have it. And how glad we are that we can study such a book as the book of Romans. Now, if I were to tell you what I'd like for you to do, I'd like for you to keep studying the book of Romans. I'd like for you to get the tapes, all of these are on tape, and play them and listen to them. I'd like for the book of Romans, you're still in the kindergarten of the book of Romans. We have just scratched the surface of the significance of the book of Romans. Now, if you'll begin to study it, you know something about your studies. And if you'll begin to study it, the richness will start coming out and start blessing and strengthening you. I don't believe a person who reads the book of Romans every day would ever backslide. 
No, that's right. If you stop reading some other things that's a bunch of trash and start reading the book of Romans. 